spirit of the plant, she comes to me in the form of a beautiful dancing green woman. Her eyes fill me with peace. Her dance fills me with peace. We really need the wildness in a, of spirit and, and the wildness of nature to survive. We won't survive without that wild spirit. It's what roots us and grounds us and gives us our strength. My name is Rosemary Gladstar and I'm a lifelong lover of plants and an herbalist. And we are on the shores of beautiful Lake Champlain in northern Vermont. Typical days are a lot like the weather, always changing and very spontaneous. I've had the good fortune to work for myself, which means that I've worked really, really hard, but it, it allows me kind of a loose structure to the day. One of the things that is a constant for me is always re reminding myself to be grateful um, each day, grateful to be alive on this planet Earth, um, grateful that uh, I live on this planet Earth. So I always start my morning by, by getting up and stepping out, even in the deep cold winters of northern Vermont, you know, going outside, often barefoot, and sometimes even naked, we live kind of privately here, and just greeting the day, you know, saying hello to the day and giving gratitude for waking up alive again, because I realize how precious that is, and grateful for all that I'm given each day on this earth, and the water, and the food, and the air, and realizing how precious that is. So it's just taking that moment to start my day in gratitude. So really, whatever comes up for me during the day, um, whatever challenges might be, or whatever tasks come up, I'm always grounded in that moment of gratitude for waking up. And I try to end my day that way as well. You know, I keep little spritzer bottles next to my bed, dream spritzers, and little um, luminous dream tincture that I take at night just as a reminder and whatever that magic those plants are working on my body, you know, just to allow them to, to do what they need to do. And then when I lay my head on my pillow, I have my little dream pillows with me. I always have actually. So that when I sleep, I have that, you know, the memory of those plants. And oftentimes they guide me in my sleep to dream about plants. So plants are some of my greatest teachers in life. So as much as I can honor them and be with them and incorporate them into my daily life, I do, because I'm constantly, constantly learning from them. A lot of times my garden is calling out, so I get up and go out and work in the garden. There's always office stuff, you know, I write a lot and, and do a lot of stuff on the computer, I'm sorry to say, so I spend time in the office. Sometimes neighbors stop by or friends who need help, that's always a heartful thing, you know, to mix up herbs. and. And, um, you know, in whatever way I can, I'm working with herbs during the day. I love, still to this day, I love going down to my apothecary and mixing up herbs, making herbal products and tea blends. So I have a beautiful home apothecary, so I get to spend time in that. And I try to live my life like nature. And really, there's very little in nature that's constant every day. It changes with, you know, daily with the seasons and where you're at in your life and where it's at in its cycles. So I just, um, yeah, and then I cook with herbs, of course, and I'm one of those people who, who it's not like a sprinkle, you know, or a dab of this or a dab of that. It's like when I cook, I use a lot of herbs in my cooking. I make my homemade tomato sauce. I put a ton of basil and a ton of oregano, and sometimes you can hardly see the tomatoes for the herbs. <laughs> so I like to use a lot of plants in just my daily living, but it's also like, I think more, even more important than ingesting them is just spending time with the plants. Like if I don't get out daily, I, I start to really m feel empty inside and disconnected. So, you know, spending a little time outside every day with the plants. I use plants on my animals. I try to keep my animals healthy with their little powders. And right now I have two kitties that have colds, so they're getting their little homeopathic and herbal blends. So yeah, it's just using plants in so many different ways. But more than anything, I think it's just trying to incorporate the consciousness of how the plants live and grow and their teachings into how I live. I want to be a reflection of nature and live that reflection in my own life for myself personally, but also for how I engage in the world. I was destined to be a plant lover, actually. I mean, my earliest, earliest dreams were plants. And I was named Rosemary, after all, in a family of Billy, Bobby, Betty, and Diane. All lovely names, but I, I feel so fortunate that I got the name Rosemary. And then I also had the great good fortune to 
grew up with a grandmother who knew a lot about plants, and she was my first guide into the world of herbalism and, and plants and plant lore. I grew up on a dairy farm in Northern California, and I remember even as a child I'd go out and I'd make a little nest in the tall grasses in our orchard, far from any kind of wandering eye, and I'd lay down in that little nest naked, and I'd just look up at that blue sky and those clouds floating by, and I would really pray to Creator. At that point, I used God, I was praying to God to make me a reflection of nature, to make it so when people looked at me, they saw the mountains and the clouds and the sky. And I don't know if that's true, but to live that way has really helped me be grounded in this world, especially with all the challenges and tasks that come our way, right? It's so important to feel grounded on this earth and connected to the great life forces that channel through us. I think probably the, the most important way to connect with plants is through nature, you know, just spending as much time outside. And even for people who live in the cities, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities to collect with nature and the plants. I always like to remind myself and other people as well that all land is sacred. So even land that's been terribly disturbed, like empty lots in the city that are littered with garbage and, you know, broken glass and, and what people think of as just weedy species is, is still sacred holy land. And sometimes that land needs more attention and care more than beautiful wilderness does, honestly. You know, so it's just really connecting to the land and the plants that are growing on the land and, and the wild things. And that's one thing that I've noticed in myself and again in other people is that we live in a climate today and a time in the world today where there's so much tameness. Our lives have become quite civilized and quite tame and we really need the wildness in a, of spirit and and the wildness of nature to survive. We won't survive without that wild spirit. It's what roots us and grounds us and gives us our strength. And there's lots of ways to, to bring that into our world. Like what again is just, you know, eating wild things and here it'd be eating those wild weeds. They have a different essence. You know, we oftentimes talk about the, the chemical constituents and the higher quality of the vitamins and minerals in these wild plants. But here I'm really talking about the spirit of wildness, the things that are able to thrive without cultivation and how that nourishes something deep in us. And then just being out in the woods as much as you can, camping in the woods and engaging in the time and wilderness, I think is so important to us today. Uh, taking our children, you know, who spend far too much time on these little devices, um, and, need, and again, they're going to need to have that connection with nature and the wildness of nature to survive. So we go camping, you know, really try to sleep outside. Or if you don't go camping, you know, try to move your bed or your, you know, your sleeping bag outside once in a while. So you sleep under the stars, you hear the river and the, the waterways. And it feeds us on the deepest cellular level because humans have existed for literally thousands and thousands of years connecting to the wild things. When I moved to northern Vermont, which really half the year is the pl most of the plants are dormant, and I hungered for the green when I first moved here. You know, I felt, I felt a real lack in those, I loved the winters, though I wondered in the beginning if I was gonna be able to survive the cold. But I really miss the green on a deep cellular level. And what I would do is I'd get my sled out in the wintertime, um, and I would actually find an evergreen and I'd lay that, you know, put my sled under the tree and then I'd just lay up there and look up at the green leaves. And, the, and it was in doing that that I really learned about plant spirit communication. It was really through the plants themselves that I learned that I could be in deep communion with the plants and I really didn't even have to see them. I could just call on them and they would come into my being and feed my, my soul. Really, it was, that's really how I learned that we humans, all humans, have that ability to really, you know, be with the plant spirits, just like we have that ability to be with human spirits or with creator spirit, that we can actually commune with those plants, whether they're present around us or not. And it's an exercise that we actually teach people to do today, you know, like how to call on those plant spirits so when you need their medicine or you need their energy or you just want to feel beauty around you because you might be someplace where it's hard to actually see beauty, you know? So you can, and beauty feeds us on the deepest level, right? So 
you can just call in that plant spirit that you love or your plant ally and it will be there it will show up for you so that's how i that's really how i survived those long winters in the beginning but really the magic that those plants taught me is they're always there for us you can do this on your own really it's just really a matter of spending time with the plants and really connecting deeply with them you know and how we do that is by really paying attention um, it's like developing re relationships with people. You know, you can have a lot of friendships, but it's those friends that you spend the most time with and you listen to and you listen to deeply and you focus on deeply. You focus on their needs and what they want and what they have to teach you. And those become our deepest, most valuable friendships, right? And so it's really cultivating that kind of relationship with, with plants and with certain plants even that maybe call you to them like we call those our plant allies they they show up for you when you really need them and we show up for them when they really need us so there's a simple technique actually that i think really comes from shamanic teachings where you actually sit with the plant and you know it doesn't have we talk about sitting with the plant it doesn't have to be for hours it can be really for 10 minutes but it's the quality of that sitting it's really quieting your mind so that you're focusing on that plant. And we oftentimes suggest to people to really engage your mind first. You know, bring your mind's attention where you're, where you're really looking at the plant, kind of focusing on how it's growing and the shape of its leaf and the shape of the flower and the color of the plant and the flower. So it's really an observation, I would say. And I always like to mention, and again, I learned this from my elders, so it's not like a personal teaching of mine, but it's always good to give gratitude and thanks when you when you sit next to a plant. It's like going to visit a friend, you know, you, you bring tea or you bring a cake or you bring a, a goodwill wish or a goodwill gift. So it's that same gratitude, you know, you might um, just give thanks for the plant and ask permission to sit, like, may I come to visit with you and sit with you. So it's that, that greeting and that asking permission. And then that focus of bringing your mind to pay attention. And if you write, or draw, you can also like, you know, write down your observations so that again, it's really bringing full attention. And all of this can just take like a few moments or an hour. It's really the depth that you want to go with this plant. And then it's once your mind is totally attuned, then it's really bypassing your mind. The whole point is to get out of your mind and to bring your attention deep into that essence of the plant. And so one of the exercises that we suggest to people to do is to allow your body to become the body of the plant. When you look at that flower, think of your head as the flower. You look at the upper part of the plant as your, the leaf and the stem and how the stem grows. And you think of your own body and then you travel down into the root where you root yourself into the earth and you travel with that plant. It's a wonderful process. And sometimes you have to move yourself out of your adult mind, out of your civilized mind, into your child mind, into that place where your playful spirit comes out. So don't take this work too seriously. This is, you know, playfulness. It's engaging with the plant. The plant invites you into itself and you travel with it down to its roots and you ground yourself. And in that place of groundedness, when you feel fully present with that plant, you might want to ask the plant, you know, respectfully ask the plant if it has a gift or, or a message or a teaching it wants to bring you. And to listen deeply. And, and almost always, you'll get something. It might come as a song. It might come as a flash. You might have a memory. You might have just a feeling in your body where your body starts to quiver. It might bring up some old memories, you know. At that point, when you feel like you've had that completion with the plant, it's nice to just travel back up, travel up to the roots. It's like a completion, not to just stop it abruptly, but bring yourself back up, back to the leaves and the torso of the plant, the, your torso, and then back up to the top. And once you've reached that place, then it's always good again to just give thanks. If you don't mind singing to the plant, you know, that singing isn't about having this beautiful voice you know, singing in a vo voice that everybody loves. It's about this resonation that happens when we, uh, the octave changes and all of nature sings, you know, and again, when we use those sacred plants to travel or we're deep in prayer or deep in a spiritual experience, we hear the tune of the universe, that all of the universe has a, has a resonance that's happening. 
And the plants are always singing, it's just our inability to hear them. So singing to the plants, or talking out loud if you're more comfortable doing that, is one of the ways that we can communicate with the plants. And so it's always good to offer a gift back. It can be through a song, it can be just a prayer. That prayer can be just, thank you, thank you so much. I look forward to being with you again. You can even have a little gift, maybe a little water or a little sprinkling of nourishment that you plant under that plant. A little bit of yourself, you can leave a piece of your hair. There's many, many different ways of just giving gratitude. Um, and then and then you can complete that experience. And oftentimes, like with these kind of things that come from the spirit world, they leave our practical everyday reality quickly. So it's often good to just write that experience down because sometimes it can be very profound and have a profound effect on our everyday life. So it's a really, really beautiful practice and um, it's a practice that you know has been utilized in many different, there's many different ways that this practice has been used in different cultures around the world. So many different variations of it, but always about connecting deeply, going into the plant, being one with the plant, to receive that information and bring it back. Well, I think that my mission in herbalism has always been to spread the joy with others. That kind of became conscious to me when when I was still quite young, in my early 20s. I, I did this horseback trip uh, with my young son, Jason. And it was on that horseback trip, we were up in the mountains of Northern California, and I bedded the horses down and my little son and I were cuddled up in our sleeping bag together. And I had really what I would say was a vision where I knew that I wanted to come back and open a home apothecary, a little herb store, and just make plants available to people in my community. And um, I had no idea where that where that simple vision would lead me. I had no great thoughts that, you know, I would become an herb teacher or make herbal products or anything. It was just wanting to share this gift that the plants was, were giving with me with the people in my community. And, you know, it was interesting for me because I was so young and really, I really hardly knew anything, but somehow I knew that even though I didn't know much, just sharing what I, the little I knew with others was, you know, a way of giving back. But I want to say the the bigger... The bigger mission of my life has always been that, and it's a personal mission actually, I think it's something that benefits me is serving others. Um, you know, just being able to help other people on their path or with their health or um, in any way that they need health. And it's not just people, it's, you know, helping animals or in some way giving back to this incredible Mother Earth that has just provided me with everything that I need to live and everything that anybody that's living on this planet, any creature, great or small, needs to live, of just being able to serve back. And as I said, I recognize that that need to give to others really benefits me more than anything else because it feeds me and it makes me feel better about myself when I'm helping others. But So I would say that's been my greatest mission. I'm, I'm really a worker bee. I'm not a queen bee. <laughs> I'm a worker bee. And... Um, yeah, I feel like I've been called into service and just to work hard in this lifetime to give out to others. Oh my, there's been so, so many lessons I've learned in this life. I think that life on this earth is a school, you know, and that we never graduate. But I think my greatest lessons have been just to learn to love more and to be ever more grateful. You know, it's like, even in the hardest times when there's so much sorrow and grief in the world, just to remember to love, that's our, that's our task and our greatest task, to love ever more and to, love, and to be ever more grateful. Um, because that's what we humans are, we really are love. And, um, and there is incredible amounts to be grateful for. And if we forget that, we lose our way, we lose the path. Um, and I think, you know, like anything, learning to love more and to be grateful for life, to be grateful for every day that we wake up, is a practice. And it's always easier to practice when everything is looking rosy in your life and looking joyful, right? When you've just fallen in love and you're so happy. It's a lot easier to, to, 
to learn to love more and to be more grateful than 80 years later when you're all old and ancient and dying, right? Or it's a lot easier to help be healthy and to do your exercises and to lift your weights when you're feeling healthy and good and life is going your way. So it's so important, and I, I speak from this knowing this personally, you know, of, of living this path. It's so important to do it as a practice, you know, to every day to remind yourself to look for the beauty. You know, like if you read all those horrible headlines and your whole spirit is drugged down, remember that in those, that horridness there are incredible acts of compassion and people who are doing everything they can to change to make this world a better place. And that the more we practice love and gratefulness, the better able we are to do that work. So I would say, and I hope that I can say this with my dying breath, that the greatest task we have is to learn to love more and to be ever more grateful. And one of the things that helps me to do that is using that beautiful Rumi poem as a mantra. I like to say this poem every day if I remember to. It's a beautiful poem. Now I will read it so I can say it. So it goes. Today, like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. Don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down a musical instrument. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are a hundred ways to kneel and kiss the earth. In the spirit of the plant, she comes to me in the form of a beautiful dancing green woman. In the spirit of the plant, she comes to me in the form of a beautiful dancing green woman. Her eyes fill me with peace. Her dance fills me with peace. Her eyes fill me with peace. Her dance fills me with peace. The spirit of the plant, she comes to me. In the form of a beautiful dancing green woman, the spirit of the plant, she comes to me. In the form of a beautiful dancing green woman, her eyes fill me with peace. Her dance fills me with peace.